Hello, everybody. Uh, I think we can start now uh, while waiting others for joining us. Honorable Vice Rector of Universitas Sumatera Utara, Professor Kopi Anjelisa, Honorable Dr. Zomar Roda, Regional Director of SIRAT, uh, Honorable Professor Alang Rival from SIRAT as the coordinator for the talent program, all speakers, Pak Gods from Golden Agri Resources, Sinarmas, Pak Fitrian from IDH, uh, Ibu Jenis Lee from NTU, Ibu Fitri from Yayasan Konservasi Indonesia, Pak Rob from Musimas, and Pak Iskandar Panjaitan from Trade of Minister, uh, Indonesian Trade of Ministry. All advisors and all beloved students, welcome to the second online workshop on palm oil sustainable supply chain and sustainable landscape. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I know uh, most of you are still in the holiday, but you still uh, uh, eagerly coming to this session. Very nice to meet you all. This year we have 13 universities from seven countries with a maximum of 13 hours difference. So special thanks for Gabrielle from Stanford, USA, which joined with us now at 2.30 a.m. local time there in US. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the University of Agriculture, Pesawa, Pakistan, Karakoram International University, Pakistan, Universitas Maliku Saleh, um, Universitas Negeri Medan, Universitas Jambi, University uh, Putra Malaysia, Universitas Andalas, Stanford University, uh, Prince of Songkla University, Patani Campus, Thailand, Universitas Mata Utara, Paris School of Economics, University Utara Malaysia, Nanyang uh, Technological University. Thank you all of you for joining, for your interest and for your support last year and this year. We started this online workshop during the pandemic last year. We were isolated during this at that time, but at the same time, we realized that distance uh, unlikely become a constraint anymore to interact one to another. From different countries uh, with different situations and conditions, we find that uh, we have some common interests and concern in which sustainability, sustainability is one of them. Uh, <clears throat> We try to bring this concern to youth participants, the future leader, by inviting experts from academicians, industries, and governments. We choose workshop as the platform with relatively limited participants and expect the activities will be more interactive, although virtually conducted. This workshop won't be able to be implemented without support from USU, CSSPO, CIRAD, the talent program. And for that, we would like to express our highest appreciation to Professor Poppy Angelisa, Professor Alain Rival, and Dr. Jean-Marc Roda. This is the second batch for this annual student workshop and still planned to be continuously conducted annually. I really hope this sustainability workshop will be a sustainable activities. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Kapungkap. Sukriya. Marsi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. With this, I pass this to uh, Dr. Rudy Sofian, who will lead uh, the whole session from today until the 7th of July. Uh, the, uh, the space is your, uh, Dr. Rudy. Thank you very much. Hello. Again, uh, we meet here like last year. I would like to welcome Dr. Professor Alan Rival from Talent Project Coordinator, uh, Mr. Jen Macroda from CIRAT, and the Honorable Ibu Professor Dr. APT Popin, who is a one. Okay, before we start the seminar, let's uh, have the opening speech. I would like to invite Professor Dr. APT Ibu Popin, who is a one, to give an opening speech. Copy. The screen is yours. So, to copy. Let's start. Do copy. Are you available now?
Could uh, maybe yeah. Ibu okay. Poppy uh, uh, just shift at the, the last one? The last the last one. Okay, then. Yeah. Okay, you. we we we, we <clears throat> allocate the session to the last one. I would like to invite Mr. Jen Makroda from Sira to give the opening speech. Mr. Roda, the screen is yours. Mr. Roda is around. Yes, Hello, Mr. Roda. yes, yes, please. Okay. So let me, uh, I, I just get out to the machette in Paris. So uh, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, I will do very short because I have another uh, card to, to catch, but uh, it is absolutely important to have this kind of uh, uh, session as we have today. Uh, today, I would like to emphasize uh, especially uh, on the importance of the small holders uh, on the palm oil. Because uh, not only in Indonesia, but everywhere where we have uh, palm oil plantations, we witness nowadays a kind of transition between uh, uh, many small, uh, uh, very, uh, many poor farmers who are also smallholders to a new, uh, uh, a, a new group of smallholders that are uh, a bit uh, more. Uh, wealthy, not too much, but just a bit more. They are growing palm oil. And those palm oil smallholders are becoming kind of uh, agripreneurs. And uh, that is changing completely the landscape of uh, the palm oil uh, economics, the palm oil sustainability, uh, for many reasons. They are millions, if you count all the countries where they are, uh, tens of millions, actually. They count very much for the local elections because uh, they are families. They employ uh, workers and uh, those uh, smallholders who are becoming uh, agripreneurs, they are at the forefront of a new revolution. Some of them are uh, over fertilizing, over uh, uh, destroying the environment. Some of them are uh, creating uh, new uh, opportunities for uh, biodiversity and sustainability. And nobody is working on that really. And I think uh, this uh, workshop that we have is, is very important to, to raise the issue because what the Talent Project is doing is going to, raise, uh, to, to, to nurture the, the future uh, managers of not only the big uh, industrial plantations, but also those who are going to work uh, for the association of smallholders or uh, to counsel the smallholders. And uh, this is extremely important. We are opening a, a, a new venue, a new future now. Uh, I think this is just the, the, the short the highlight I wanted to give you and, and to, to have for the, for the today uh, and the, the coming days uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Roda. <clears throat> Next, uh, let's join me to welcome Ms. Professor Alain Rival uh, to give an opening speech. Professor Rival, the screen is yours. Yeah, hello to everyone. Can you hear me? Hello, we can hear you. Okay. Excellent. I uh, try to share my screen. This is that okay for you guys? Yes, sir. Okay. So, yeah. uh, without any further ado, we just uh, um, thank. Again, uh, the group in Yusu because the, I know it's been a great job in organizing um, remotely and once again um, by virtual means this uh, um, course and this uh, workshop and try to gather all the students for many different uh, time zones and, uh, and sensitivities. So thank you very much, Jenna, for organizing that since the early beginning of CSSPO. So, of course, um, we are supporting uh, CSSPO still at the early beginning because uh, our program talent is really aimed at increasing awareness and increasing knowledge about the questions which are raised by the small orders um, everywhere in the world. It's not a new question, it's not a new type of actors. It's business as usual, but what is not no more business as usual is the, the way that uh, um, who are considering uh, plantation management. So I will give you just a few slides. Um, they want to make a long introduction. The important thing is the workshop itself. But I would just to 
I'd like to remind you what is talent and what we can help in um, building and reinforcing the CSSPO network. So we have uh, we have bring this platform called Talent. Uh, it's a, a training program uh, aimed at raising awareness amongst plantation managers in Southeast Asia. Well, uh, the, the program is uh, operated by CIRAD, my institution, and the funds come from AFD, which is a French development bank, which is helping us in um, um, organizing and uh, implementing this project. What is Talent? Talent is a training project. It's not a research project. It's very close to research because the topics we are addressing are, are just connected to research. But we want to share the visions for sustainable plantation uh, landscape. Uh, sorry, sorry, about... sorry, Alain. Yep. Uh, are you going to share your uh, slides or you? Yeah. It's supposed to be sharing at the moment. Um, uh, it's not working. Yeah, we cannot see anything. Oh, OK, I'll try to correct that. Uh, excuse me for that. Is it better? You can see join a live Zoom demo there. How can I do that? Uh... Do you want to send this to us so we can send, share it? Oh, yeah, it's working now. It's working now? Ah, beauty. Yes. Much better. Excuse me about that. Okay. What about if I, is it okay now? Yes, sir. No change for them, sir. Okay. So sorry. Um, there are a few slides. Um, yeah, we're just at the beginning. So we want to share this vision of, of sustainable landscape, which means that we are not taking care only of the plantation itself but also what's around the plantations, the, the forest, of course, but also the other activities. So we are considering uh, the plantation as part of the landscape. And we'd like to raise awareness among managers in the region about the vision of uh, sustainable plantation landscape. And for that, um, our aim is to renovate the training system, not putting it upside down and try to make, build a new master's course, a new everything. We just want to use what's already in place, the master courses which are already working, um, which are already in place in the, the, the countries um, or destination of the project. And then we just put a couple of uh, activities to uh, implement those uh, um, new vision of um, uh, sustainability in the landscape. Why we, we, we thought it was the right moment for that? It's because more and more, the, 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 we are more talking of sustainability managers than plantation managers. The managers are more and more in charge of sustainability. This is more on the agenda. And we are wondering if they are ready for that. If the training system is really operating in a sense that uh, the new managers are ready to face the new challenges. I will cite a few of them, I will not, uh, give you the whole program or the whole project in the, the four countries, uh, but you have a, a, just a flavor of what we're intending and with what we are beginning to do for almost six months now. This is a list of uh, those um, uh, sustainability issues. There are much, many more, of course, but uh, climate change is, is probably the first one. We have to be ready for that. I'm not sure that um, the training system is already delivering uh, knowledge about uh, the risk and the, 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 the what is behind climate change, the changing practices we must uh, work on and um, how to tackle, how to prevent this climate change. We had a, a very severe El Nino in 2015. Everybody knows that the periodicity of the El Nino is more or less seven to eight years. So it's going to happen in 2023, 2024, maybe. So are we ready for that? Are we change our practices or are we change our planting material or our planting designs to face this challenge? I'm not sure about that. So we have to discuss about that and train our young people about this challenge. This is just one among 
a, a long list. The quality of uh, and the trustability of product, whatever it's rubber or oil palm or timber, uh, the markets, they, they want more and more traceability. They want to know where and when this product was made and by who and with which principles it has been followed. So quality of product with full traceability is another challenge. Of course, taking care of the communities and the civil society is very important, uh, especially uh, for plantation um, species in which uh, there's a long history of uh, movement of people, movement of manpower. Um, this uh, uh, part of the communities in our landscape is very important as well. And we have to report to the civil society what we're doing, we think it's good, what we're doing, which we could improve. It has to be transparent and, and report to the deciders of the, the civil society. And last but not least, protect biodiversity. That's more than important, especially in, in places where uh, damage has been done, where I'm also running a project in Sabah in which we are reforesting, rebinding the forest around the plantation um, with a view of uh, promoting wildlife movements and improve environmental services. Uh, this list is not closed, it's, there are many, many other subjects, but it's just to show you that we want to be sure that these topics are already part of the initial training and in the, of the, the vocational training we can offer to uh, our students or our professionals uh, in the framework, under the framework of talent. What is our strategy? Very simple, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, we just want to update uh, a selection of ongoing training courses. This one, the CSSP01, is an example. Um, last month we did another training course in, in Thailand, which was organized by Cassettes Art University. There's the same philosophy, we don't reinvent the wheel, we're just uh, putting a few new notions, uh, integrating new notions in a, in a course which is already existing, which already accepted, which already uh, which has his own life and his own programming. So we don't change anything in the scheduling, we're just adding a few new flavors in the, in the training course. Um, for that, we're using a, a body of experts. Some of them come from CIRAD, some of them come from sister institutions, um, universities from the region. We want to educate in the campus, but we also to want to educate on the ground. And most of the training sessions which, which are sponsored by talent uh, have a very strong um, uh, component, which is uh, uh, field studies, field courses, uh, field days. We want to take uh, the students and the professionals out of the campus. Uh, studying in the campus is important, of course, but we want also to show them example, to make them scratch their head of what they are seeing, uh, what they like, what they don't like, and is it sustainable and why it is not if it's not. So, educating on the ground is really a, a, the trademark of talent. Research and innovation and this dialogue is very important because most of the people who are uh, involved in talent are also researchers. So, um, they will talk the students, they will talk the professional about their own experience, uh, first-hand experience, so that's very important to show that research is a kind of living animal. It's always nurturing in himself with new questions and especially from the students. This is very important. Entrepreneurship, you know, um, that's very important as well. It's a part of the government, part of the local banks. We want also to train um, the, the, the staff from the banks, uh, especially the local development banks, um, to the realities and to the questions which are raised on the ground by this uh, uh, improvement to our sustainability. And of course, uh, because we are training young scientists, we're training young managers, we're training young professionals, uh, we must be aware of what is the job market, what the, the, the job market needs, what are the needs in niche uh, commodity chains, um, in order to train uh, young professionals who can be uh, recruited as soon as possible. These are a few of the elements of our strategy. And for that, uh, we're just renewing some modules of the content. We're not um, renovating the full system from A to Z, but there are a couple of things we want to insist on. We want to connect the students to international agenda and environment, because most of them, 
including their lecturers, they are not enough aware of the importance of the sustainable development goal of the Paris Agreement. This kind of international agreements are not something just in the news. They are, they are shaping the international relationship between the countries and the involvement of countries in, in questions related to plantation management, like uh, climate change or sustainable development. So this brings us to revisiting the plantation model. The plantation model is one century old. Uh, it provided a lot of benefit. It took a lot of people out of poverty. But now there are emerging questions, not only climate change, but also manpower. And the recent pandemic, unfortunately, has showed that um, most of the industry, industries in the plantation commodities are, are relying on uh, foreign manpower, are relying on the free movement of people in plantations, um, are very sensitive to climate change. So maybe this model has to be revisited and maybe we have to uh, provide new answers to this, uh, to this model, the question raised by this model, including agroforestry, agroecology, um, finding adaptative models uh, with more resilience to the, the climate change than the one we have at the moment. Another very important um, part in renewing our, our teaching and our, our lecturing is uh, the approaches on commodity trades. Um, the, the trade of commodities, especially uh, tropical commodities has changed a lot. Uh, it's all about certification, it's all about quarantining not only the quality but also the origin and um, the, 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 the way this uh, um, commodity is produced on the ground. So there are more and more implication of uh, plantation managers in the certification process of their commodity and we, have to, we want to be sure that we're really aware about the usefulness of certification. What I've seen till now is most of the young managers, they are, they are working in certification because they're asking, the boss, the boss is asking for that, but they're not convinced of the, the usefulness of the, of the certification. So we want to be sure that uh, the certification approach is really part of the curriculum. Of course, we cannot um, address all the questions in all the plantation crops. So and everywhere in the tropical world. So we choose uh, four countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam. This has been selected by the funder, by AFD. They wanted to, uh, uh, what it does to work on a, on a select bunch of uh, countries, not all of them. So these are the limits, the boundaries of the project. The other boundary is the, uh, the sectors we're going to work on. There will be four of them, rubber, oil palm, hardwood and pulpwood. Um, we don't directly work on coffee, um, cocoa, these other communities, even if the, 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 the problems are the same and the, the questions about sustainable production is exactly the same if we work on coconut or cocoa or oil palm. But yes, that, that was the, the, the limits which was imposed by the, by the funder. Uh, well, and we're going to have four target groups for training, of course students, uh, from master levels to um, um, bachelor level, um, depends on the university we're working on, or maybe some students from lower levels, it's not a problem if you want to follow a few courses. Uh, the second target group is plantation managers, people are already working in the plantation sector but they want to renovate their knowledge. Um, this is a very important target group for us because they are raising everyday uh, problems. They are, they are connected to the ground and they can ask very precise questions on, on the sustainability of, their, sustainability of their practices. Another group is the cooperative managers, same philosophy. Uh, there are countries in which, like in Thailand, where the, the cooperative system, especially in Orpan, is very well developed. So it's a good way also to um, provide information on sustainable landscape using the cooperative managers as vectors. And then the fourth target group, the fourth target group is bank executives, uh, because we want to connect the banking sector with the questions of sustainability. We want these people who are providing funds to small orders, to uh, mid-sized plantations, even to large plantations, to connect their, uh, their activity or their, um, their uh, job as uh, executives, bank executives, to sustainability criteria. 
and uh, uh, we want those bank executives to understand what is sustainable plantation management and why they should or should not provide funds to this type of plantations or not. So these are the four target groups. Uh, just an eye on the scheduling. Uh, of course, it's been a lot of uh, delays, a lot of changes because of the COVID pandemics. Of course, we just began working on a project when uh, the pandemic, what the pandemic, what as it speaks in Southeast Asia. So uh, we've been very late, but we hope to have all the signatures of uh, memorandum of understanding with the four countries. At least two of them, probably uh, Indonesia and Thailand first, and then. Malaysia and uh, Vietnam second. This is the will of the, the funder. Um, the, the, the documents are almost ready. We're still waiting for the last approval from AFD uh, and then we can proceed to the signatures of MOUs. With that, uh, we will uh, begin immediately the educational, educational activities. But as you can see, with this uh, CSSPO workshop, we already began um, a lot of activities already in Thailand, on the ground, already here in uh, Indonesia with the CSSPO and we will shortly um, begin our, our summer schools and training, training courses in, uh, in the first two countries and then after probably after December, which is a couple of months ago, um, we will uh, begin our, our uh, activities in the second row of countries. Um, and the project will and at the end of 2025, we still have some uh, flexibility on that. The funder is, is okay for if we begin late to uh, finish a bit later than uh, the end of 2025, if needed. Um, so this is uh, uh, the global framework of the project. Uh, we, CIRAD, we are the implementer, we are the designers of the project, and uh, uh, we probably know us, we have uh, um, offices in, in uh, Jakarta. I was the former uh, regional director of this office. Uh, and um, the funder is AFD, is a French development bank, uh, which provided 1.2 million euros uh, to implement this project on the five years, including uh, the feasibility phase we just finished uh, last month. So if you've got any question, I will be more than happy to answer and we'll be around around the, the coming days to, uh, to talk with you about this project. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Alain Sirat. Uh, a very nice breakthrough of that project. <coughs> Let's see uh, whether we can go to the... Uh, uh, first, I'm going to read the uh, housekeeping, uh, about the ground rules of these conferences. Uh, I would like to share first the uh, grouping. I believe you have this, but uh, let me check. Uh, all right, okay. The rules and housekeeping, okay. Next slide, go ahead. Okay. Each participant has been divided into eight mixed group with four to five members. I will read the members for you later. And each group has received one Zoom account for group communication discussing coordination. Each group is free to decide the time, but not at least record it and submit one short video, maximum five minutes of all process, namely the member of group introduction, summary of each topic and group presentation preparation that will be uploaded on YouTube. This is what you do for the workshop rules. Next slide. Participants need to attend all session from 4 to 7 July 22, 2020. Rundown have been attached in the WhatsApp group. Session start at 1.30 p.m. Indonesian time at 4th July and 2 p.m. Indonesian time on 5th to 7th July 22, 2022. Please fill in the attendee G form for each day, share in the Zoom chat. Together with each group members, participants need to accomplish the three video tasks, introduction, summary, presentation that will be on YouTube, and send to the provided links. Tax details have been attached in the WhatsApp group. Presentation and YouTube videos will be assessed by judges on 7 July 2020 to be selected as the best presentation for sustainable awareness raisers. All participants need to mute their voice, but put the camera on as the program will be recorded as a material of e-learning. Okay, and then this is the 
assessment criteria for the best presentation. We'll check conformity to the team, 20%, systematic and coordinated, 15%, creativity, 20%, clarity, 20%, relevance with your role, 15%, and presenters appearance, 10%. So the total assessment criteria will be weighed at 100 points. I want you to work and check this uh, criteria so we can get the best presentation of your video. All right, next, can we share the grouping? I, just, I would like to remind again to read the name of the grouping. The committee, can you share the grouping? Okay, the grouping session for the topic of a global market demand. We have one group here with, uh, okay, I think we can share this in the chat. If you don't have it, maybe you can have a look. It takes more than I expected to read this all. So I want you to check. We'll share this in the link again for you because the committee will share in the chat room. Please, Ibu Rianti, share, share this file in the chat room. And we can proceed to the next activity. Okay. Uh, before we go, <clears throat> let's do the pretest before we start the uh, seminar. Yeah, pretest will be done through the Mentimeters. Okay. Okay. Please grab your handphone, or maybe you put you go to www.menti.com and use the code. 41037755. I want you all to go to menti.com, register your name, and put the code 41037755. And I want you to answer the questions. Check your handphone again. I repeat the code 41037755. <laughs> okay. Many participants we have. Okay, please share again for the entry. The committee, please share again the mental the slides. So we can check. Just share the mental method, please. Okay. Wait, Ruth, wait. Yes, we we'll wait. Okay, while waiting, maybe we just want to uh, add some information that Professor Alain already shared that we are going to have similar uh, summer course, but offline one. But this is only limited, I think, only to 30 uh, participants, and all will be covered except your written tickets. Okay. Okay, three responses so far. Again, go to menti.com, use the code 4103 Okay, does your country import palm oil? My response is say yes. Six responses so far, all say yes. Seven responses, okay, nine. And, okay. 11 response, 14. Fourteen. Fifteen. Okay, go ahead. Seventeen. Does your country import palm oil? You answer this in menti.com. You use the code 4103. 7755. We have 17 responses so far. Answering yes. Okay. 19 yes. Okay. While others are giving answer to the first question, we better hold this. Uh, Ibu Poppy is now ready. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Honorable Vice Rector Tri Yusuf, Ibu Professor Dr. Epiti Poppy, Dr. Sajid Nasibuan, and 
MSE as ready to open this uh, seminar officially. I would like, please join me to welcome Ibu Professor Dr. Poppy Adirjaitu. Ibu Poppy, the screen is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Dr. Professor Alain Rival, Talent Project Coordinator, Dr. Jane Mark Roda, Director Regional Sirat, Dr. God. Martin, Director of Sustainability and Strategic Project, PT Smart TPK, Mr. Fitrian Ardiansa, Head of the Yayasan Inisiatif Dagang Hijau, Management Board, all supervisors and students. Welcome to the second joint online workshop, which starts from the 4th to the 7th of July 2022. Thank you for being part of this annual activity. This online workshop aims to create a forum that links academicians the government and businessmen in discussion a stable sustainability palm oil supply chain and the landscape of palm oil. Palm oil is one of the most globally discussed commodities in the world. Therefore, I'm sure this workshop will spark stimulating and fruitful discussion. We will discuss internationally traded commodities among future international leaders, which align with the mission of Universitas Sumatra Utara of being part of global education. For this year, we have 13 universities from seven countries participating in the workshop, including the three largest producing countries, namely Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, and the four largest consuming countries, namely Pakistan, Singapore, the USA, and France. Several universities have established long-term partnership with USU, but this will be the first collaboration for several others. As Vice Rector T3 for Research Community Service and Cooperation, I hope that this workshop can act as the first step toward closer cooperation in the future. I wish you a, a, you a great time in this workshop and hope you can strengthen your network of ten new insights and share your views and experience among yourself. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Ibu Professor Mokia Sibuan for a brief uh, opening speech. Uh, now let's get back to the PPS. Uh, Ibu Rianti, can you share the screen again to the Mentimeter? So we will accept responses. Okay, all right. Okay, now we have 24 responses. To the first question, does your country import palm oil? Uh, mostly say yes. Uh, one say that important, of course, and one response, I think, say no. All right, 24 seven responses. Let, maybe we can move to the next question, please. My, my question is my Okay, next question. Do you use palm oil derivative product in your daily activities? Do you use palm oil derivative product in your daily activities? Again, you can answer now. Use the code 4103-7755. Yes. <laughs> palm oil derivative product, yes, often, always. So, uh, Absolutely. I yes, work. I do. Uh, no. Okay, not really. Uh, Mostly. Uh, okay, often exactly. Every day. Yeah, I, mean. yes. I, mean. I guess so. Yes, I do. Not really. I use, okay. Do you use palm oil derivative product in your daily activities? We have 26 responses. Mostly say yes with different expressions. Let's say mostly, often, absolutely, of course, exactly. Okay. Yes. The last question, yes. Pak Rode, wait yes. for a moment, please. The last question, the third question. Do you know about sustainably managed palm oil? Sustainably managed palm oil, again, 
Now you go to demantic.com, use the different code now to answer these different questions. Use the code 948054468. Go to demantic.com, use the code 948054468. Do you know about sustainably managed palm oil? Not really, not yet. Okay, a bit. Right. Not really is uh, the responses. So far, we can conclude that uh, each country uh, import palm oil and we use it mostly quite often in our daily activities. But we don't really know anything. Maybe we know little about sustainably managed palm oil. The response is here. I think so. Not sure. Not so much. Not at all. Little bit. Not much. We have 21 responses so far then we think uh, this will uh, give uh, this will give a clearer picture of what the audience today will will have I think, I think here you will really learn a lot about uh, sustainably managed palm oil okay 21 responses i don't think we have more okay Iburia. yes Right, 22 responses. Okay, 23. Okay, uh, let's move to the next session because uh, we don't have uh, much time. I want you all to watch a uh, video playback about the global market demand. Yeah, we will play the video playback. Uh, so far, from the pre-test, we know that each country mm. import palm oil. <laughs> All right, okay. here we go. Let me watch The speaker is sorry. I want some people there. They should turn off the uh, turn off the speaker. They yeah, the computer in the room. Please turn off the speaker, please. Okay, have you watched it? Can still, the voice is echoing. Please use one video, one laptop in one room. Okay, please use one laptop and to play the video. Or turn off the speaker of other laptops. So Just wait. Okay. Are we ready with the video like that? Yes, please turn off. Palm oil have intensified and shifted in recent years. To see where public focus is directed, Diameter surveyed hundreds of recent media stories. We grouped leading issues into environmental and social themes, then researched how the RSPO addresses them. The main environmental concerns raised in media are deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, and biodiversity. Deforestation was by far the most frequent topic, appearing in 54% of all articles. RSPO addresses this issue by prohibiting members from cutting primary forests or any customary forest without consent of local communities. RSPO also bans conversion of secondary log forests required to maintain high conservation values or those that are legally protected. Closely linked to deforestation are greenhouse gas emissions. RSPO's approach to this issue lays the groundwork for future emission reductions and transparent reporting, which will be mandatory after 2016. RSPO scored well in addressing concern on biodiversity impacts of oil palm. RSPO has in place requirements for active management of HDV areas, protection for threatened species, requirements to control hunting, and strict avoidance of protected areas. The top three social issues raised in the media 
are safeguarding the rights of indigenous peoples, respect for human rights, and benefit sharing. As long-standing concerns of oil palm, RSPO's measures on these issues are comprehensive and scored moderate to high, reflecting improvements over time and active learning. Our study shows that RSPO has measures in place to address market demands, and there are actions underway to strengthen them. We recommend the following to accelerate the process. First, HCV is a cornerstone of RSPO's approach in limiting deforestation and protecting biodiversity. RSPO must continue to improve the consistency and quality of HCV assessments and consider integrating HCV with emerging high carbon stock mapping. Action is underway to address this. RSPO is working with the HCV Resource Network to strengthen HCV through independent licensing of assessors, direct monitoring of quality, and improved transparency. Second, RSPO should tighten requirements for greenhouse gas emission reductions and consider setting emission thresholds to ensure consistent application. RSPO is taking actions to address this by creating standard reporting tools, for example, Palm GHG Calculator, and phasing in requirements to report emissions from land use change for all new plantations. Third, to continue strengthening social performance, RSPO will need to encourage broader multi-stakeholder participation to help ensure social issues are well managed around the world. Lastly, RSPO should build upon its recent impact report by commissioning an independent study of certified plantations to demonstrate RSPO's effectiveness compared to other approaches. This would highlight areas to improve and set a baseline to monitor RSPO's effectiveness in the future. RSPO is a multi-stakeholder organization that sets standards through consensus among members. This approach may limit how high performance standards can be set for some issues, but has made RSPO the most widely adopted palm oil certification scheme. Transformation in palm oil industry will take time, and more should be done, but change that is supported by all members means that once new requirements are agreed, they become the new norm for sustainability. And that is something all of us can value. Thank you for the video playback. Uh, now, without further ado, let's join me to welcome Mr. Fitrian Ardiansa uh, with a topic talking about global market demand, issues and challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Fitrian Ardiansa is the chairman of Yayasan Initiative Dagang Hijau. He obtained a master's degree in environmental management and development from the Australian National University in Canberra, focusing on ecological and environmental economics, and bachelor degree at the Environmental Engineering Department, the Institute of Technology, Bandung, focusing on environmental quality management. He has more than 22 years working experience in the field of ecological, environmental economics, natural resource management, integrated spatial and land use planning, sustainable communities, sustainable forest management, as well as climate change and energy. His critical coverage of work includes area inside Indonesia, Australia, and Asia Pacific. He is also a board member of Partnership for Indonesia Sustainable Agriculture, Peace Agro, a board member of LTKL, Linkar Temu Kabupaten Lestari of Sustainable District Alliances, a regional committee member for Tropical Forest Alliances 2020, World Economic Forum, TFA 2020, or WEF in South Asia, and an executive board member of SCOPI, Sustainable Coffee Platform of Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mr. Fitrian Ardiaksa. Mr. Fitrian, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Padudi, um, for inviting me. I hope uh, you all can hear me. It's uh, been an honor to uh, be here. 
uh, with all of you. Ibu Diana, thank you so much. Uh, Ibu Poppy as well. And I've seen also uh, Alang Rival, uh, a good friend, long time no see, um, as well as uh, Good Martin. Um, I will try to share my uh, screen, if you don't mind. Uh, so hopefully I can do this. Uh, can you see my slide? Uh, okay, um, I think you can, yes, we can yeah. see. Yes, can. So thank you so much. And so um, what I'm trying to do right now is to um, bring the perspective of the global uh, market uh, viewing a particular commodity, namely palm oil. Uh, from Indonesia in this context, but also from uh, different parts of the world, um, Malaysia, Thailand, and others, because uh, there have been some, uh, of course, perceptions uh, built up um, in the context of palm oil, sustainability, and more and more also uh, related to different issues. Um, but um, before talking about that, some of you may not know uh, IDH, uh, in, in Bahasa Indonesia, we call this Initiative Dagang Hijau or Sustainable Trade Initiative. Uh, basically, we work and focus on several different uh, globally traded commodities. Uh, what uh, we aim is to have transformation of these uh, globally traded commodities to achieve uh, sustainable impacts, um, be it uh, better environment, uh, no deforestation, uh, better income, uh, welfare of uh, farmers, better wages, um, uh, labors, and of course, the reduc reduction of agrochemical as well as um, um, gender. Uh, so it's not only palm oil, uh, we work and focus on coffee, rubber, and many others as well across Indonesia. Of course, not all uh, provinces in Indonesia we cover, but at least we got uh, that kind of representation. Uh, but Rudy as an, as an MC has also um, uh, provided some backgrounds uh, related to IDH or related to my positions. Uh, of course, we can work uh, um, by ourselves, uh, focusing on uh, addressing uh, such impacts uh, or getting to such impacts. But we also work with different donors, different platforms like uh, Pisaglo Partnership for in, uh, Indonesia Sustainable Agriculture, uh, in which uh, Goods Company, uh, PT Smart, or uh, Sinarmas or Gar uh, Golden Agri Sources is part of the member. In fact, they are founding members of the Pisaglo platform because I think any good business models uh, for sustainable palm oil uh, from the producing countries can only be having meaningful and impactful uh, outcomes if we can also share such models with different companies, with different organizations, and also with different countries. So that's uh, quite key. But um, to be able also to understand about global market demand, we also need to understand about the supply chains. I think uh, I don't have to uh, teach about supply chain. You, 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 uh, you guys, so uh, all of you know about how uh, complex uh, the supply chains of uh, several different commodities. Sometimes um, the producers are not necessarily uh, cultivating and producing and directly selling to uh, manufacturers, um, but also they, uh, in many ways, uh, ended up having their own products being bought by the middleman, for instance. And then the middleman then link this to, uh, in the context of palm oil PKS, yeah, uh, mills or palm oil mills. And of course, then uh, being manufactured uh, more and more, and not only as a CPO but also, or PKO, PKO but also uh, with different type of uh, uh, products or derivatives. And with this, we also need to understand when it comes to uh, global uh, market demand, it's not only about one single demand. It's not only coming from consumer, of course, Consumer would, would be the ultimate, uh, let's say, voice. And then most of the time, the voice then uh, was or is being uh, put it out loud by the media, by different NGOs, but in fact, even also government in uh, consuming countries. But also then um, uh, the information disseminated uh, is disseminated through these different layers of uh, supply chains. Uh, from uh, the brands, uh, the like of, uh, uh, you know, consumer good for companies, brand, Unilever, Dove, uh, Nestle, with uh, different type of uh, chocolate products, uh, for instance. They're also trying to uh, put uh, emphasis on what sort of sustainability criteria that they want, what sort of trustability that they want, and what sort of, uh, you know, amount of volume that they want uh, with that kind of standard. So, it's, it's really complex, uh, but uh, at the end, of course, uh, we have to understand that kind of uh, 
complexity and try to uh, make the best of use uh, uh, implementations on the ground to uh, meet the, the requirement coming from the global demand. But uh, we, we only talk about, I mean, in these uh, supply chains, we only talk about, uh, you know, the trading chains uh, in uh, many commodity sectors, uh, if not all, um, uh, off takers or buyers or traders are also connected to the financiers, financial institutions. Now financial institutions are also being pushed, being pressured by uh, both consumers, media, and also government in uh, consuming countries. Uh, many banks, for instance, now would require uh, certain investment to be having ESG, um, environment, social, and governance uh, standards or requirement. And then because of that, they will do a pre-screening or screening of such investment. If the, let's say, investment for new uh, plantations or even replanting of plantation, uh, for this case, palm oil, uh, will not uh, meet the standard of ESG, environment, social, and uh, governance, they will not give the uh, money. They will not give uh, the loan or finance. This is on top of, of course, the return and the profitability that they will calculate. So it's, it's, uh, it's not only complex when it comes to the trading and supply chains demand, but also now uh, you will be combined with this kind of uh, demands coming from the financiers. And of course, connecting such demands to be then, uh, let's say, understood, uh, first and foremost, and secondly, uh, to be applied uh, would require certain amount of uh, resources, uh, activities, as well as, let's say, uh, entities that would help farmers, because uh, I heard uh, from Alang, I heard from uh, different speakers before, uh, farmers are millions of them. Uh, you can't just ask individual farmers to do something uh, to meet the demand of uh, the consumer. Hence, you have uh, to get good aggregators. Uh, be it cooperatives on the ground, be it the mills itself, be it, um, let's say, Boomdesk, for instance, village uh, level institutions, and perhaps also connecting it to input providers like fertilizer providers, like good agriculture practices providers, technical, technical assistance, access and services. Because to meet the standard, you need to have that kind of transformations, uh, business as usual, conversion from, uh, let's say, the past uh, practices toward the future practice, and it would require such uh, good aggregators connecting uh, to the demands of off takers and financiers. So it's not going to be easy, uh, but of course um, we have to do something uh, as much as possible to understand and of course to uh, apply and execute uh, such demands. And whether those demands are correct, uh, this is something that of course we can debate and we can discuss. And But some of the key demands, uh, if I may say, that are quite uh, convergence, um, talk about or discuss about or voice by so many different uh, parties, both consumers, uh, consumer good forum companies, the brands, even uh, companies like <clears throat> uh, goods uh, company like Agar and others. Uh, I think we underst understood quite well. Uh, one, of course, is about better environment. They want to see that any cultivation, any production coming from producing countries will not further jeopardize the environment in many ways. Uh, in the case of uh, palm oil, it is connected to forest deforestation, for instance. They want to see that, yes, we can and we have to improve uh, the amount of the productions of uh, palm oil without having to uh, jeopardize or dis disturb uh, the, you know, the remaining forest, the remaining peatland. And of course, they want to see that uh, the production will not, that, uh, will not lead to, uh, let's say, fires, uh, like Alang said in 2015, a massive uh, forest and land fires happening due to different type of uh, land use, uh, land use change and activities. And secondly, um, I think it is also quite clear that the global market demand now is focusing more and more on income of farmers. Um, of course, uh, this is a, a challenge, but also an opportunity because I think many farmers, many palm oil farmers in Indonesia and also abroad in Malaysia and also in Thailand have shown that uh, due to palm oil, they can improve their own livelihood, their own welfare towards better income, towards better uh, you know, state of, of, of their wealth, for instance. So it is quite clear. They want also to uh, see that any investment, any activities on palm oil or sustainable palm oil will also contribute to the improvement of far farmers' welfare. I think the biggest challenge of all in, with this is uh, the fact that we in Indonesia, especially, we still have a large amount of uh, independent smallholders, independent small farmers that may not necessarily be uh, equipped, 
may not necessarily be having the capacity similar to the plasma farmers. So they need to be uh, supported when it comes to uh, you know, local uh, aggregation, like cooperatives, farmer organization connected uh, again with the mills, uh, having good agronomies and so on and so forth. Uh, increasing their productivity, quality, and because of that, they can get uh, the support uh, from, um, let's say, the buyers and traditional uh, supporters. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it would be good also to see uh, that kind of um, uh, noise or voice. Uh, I think uh, to to understand which one is the one. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's so many things uh, talk about and discuss, uh, but uh, it, it is going to be crucial if we also see what sort of priority that uh, is important according to uh, consumer or media or uh, buyers and what sort of things that producers uh, can do uh, as uh, soon as possible, uh, applying or, or responding to such a demand. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it is about better, better environment. It's about no deforestation, no pitland conversions, uh, no, no fires and so forth. And um, also uh, it's about uh, improvement of uh, income and livelihood of uh, smallholders. I think if we can focus on the two things uh, like this, it would be so, uh, I wouldn't say easy, but relatively easier for uh, the palm oil sector in Indonesia as well as the, the government and, uh, of course, smallholders to uh, transform and develop a gradual uh, improvement um, to address and also to meet the, the standard. Of course, if you talk to, uh, I mean, a, a good smart in, uh, goods can, can explain to you, if you want to meet the, the, the best of the best standard, it will require so much uh, uh, effort and to support uh, smallholders or farmers will require also a huge investment. But I think we have to focus on things that we can do. So now, whether the, the demand or the global demand, uh, the request coming from consumers really transform or transferred into uh, you know, um, um, the willingness to pay uh, by consumers. Uh, in some market, that can be correct. Um, so some market, uh, some consumers, some uh, segment of uh, buyers, for instance, are willing to pay much more. If uh, smallholders, if farmers, if uh, companies or concession are producing sustainable palm oil, but some others uh, are asking this without uh, wanting to pay more because they see this as a responsibility of uh, companies, responsibility of farmers, responsibility of the producing country governments to produce uh, sustainable products. So I think <clears throat> that kind of thing also need, we need to, to have uh, the understanding of what is possible and what is uh, options uh, or better options uh, for farmers and also for uh, concessions to do much more. And as you can see here, um, um, in uh, many ways in uh, different countries, to be able to transform that demand uh, and applying it on the ground, it will require tremendous amount of, of efforts, tremendous amount of investment and also uh, support coming from the policies, the budget coming from the government, agreement from uh, key stakeholders, uh, applications of um, you know, responsible practices, uh, scaling up in uh, certain jurisdictions. So it's not only one or two farmers uh, developing it well, but the rest is still like business as usual. At the end, if this is the case, I think palm oil or any commodity will still get bashed because um, let's say deforestation will still happen, fire will still happen, maybe also income will not be achieved, I mean, improvement of income. And of course, this also with, would link to green investment. What sort of investment we're talking about? How much it, uh, we need? We can also ask back to the investor or financier, are they willing to support uh, such uh, transformations? Uh, if uh, we talk about replanting for uh, concession and also for uh, farmers, it will require like $5,000 per hectare. Uh, if you calculate how many hectares uh, are uh, needed for replanting, in two or three or five years down the road, it will be perhaps 100 or 200,000 hectares across Sumatra and perhaps Kalimantan. It would require a huge amount of uh, investment. So can we ask back um, uh, the investor and also the buyers to commit and also to support back? So I think the global demand uh, and, and coming from the market could also be used by us, by the producing countries as a good entry point for negotiations of uh, you know, asking back on 
or requesting back for them to uh, to support us as as uh, we have uh, already for instance shown in different uh, areas uh, we are also wanting that companies uh, those that are requesting um, and also governments that are uh, requesting uh, sustainable palm oil uh, to produce they also need to chip in they, they also need to develop that kind of policies uh, incorporated in uh, the budgeting system of them and also creating this what we call sourcing area that is going to be developed uh, to meet the sustainable uh, palm oil standard for instance um, we uh, with that kind of let's say uh, knowledge and understanding we connect uh, the buyers we connect uh, the producers and of course uh, there is government in between to find ways to find solutions uh, of course, agreement needs to take place, uh, you know, uh, at the first uh, place. And then, of course, uh, sharing about the responsibility, sharing about burden, how much or how, uh, how big the efforts coming from the buyers that they would like to chip in to support the transformation and how much efforts that the concession, the farmers need to do much more uh, to transform the productions of uh, palm oil and a different commodity in those areas. So that's that's kind of uh, that's the kind of thing I think that will be so crucial uh, to understand also to connect the dots between the global demand coming from the market, but also uh, the ability of producing countries uh, to respond and also to negotiate, uh, of course, for the better. So it's not only about <coughs> uh, race to the bottom, but also rest uh, to the top. So can we create some nuance, uh, some platform in which people uh, having similar understanding, but also willing to contribute and to contemplate. Uh, I'm just uh, sharing some of the uh, experience and um, uh, initiatives or efforts done in different uh, places in uh, Indonesia, facilitated by us and also by partners, including companies like uh, uh, Sinalmas, for instance, to push forward for these transformations, connecting uh, the global demand and also producers, and uh, uh, more and more connecting also the investment uh, or the financial institutions uh, request but also not only about their request uh, to not uh, to invest in uh, unsustainable palm oil but also we push much more uh, to ask them to also invest in sustainable palm oil so for instance uh, this is the case in which uh, some uh, global financial partners have already allocated 500 million dollars plus uh, to support uh, such investment uh, to support the development of certain mills that will cover much more smallholders or to invest in replanting or to invest in uh, any type of uh, efforts or uh, activities or plans that can uh, achieve both better environment, better income in certain areas related to palm oil and also different commodities. So these are the examples in which uh, those money have been uh, disbursed. So this is commercial transaction, commercial investment. This is not grant. This is not like uh, a charity. Uh, the, the request coming from financial institution now being packaged, being uh, structured in which they can support sustainable rubber, they can support uh, sustainable village forest development, they can also support sustainable palm oil, like uh, in East Kalimantan, $30 million has been uh, you know, given or, or invested in uh, PTBSNG uh, to develop that kind of sustainable palm oil, uh, mills facility development, as well as smallholders' um, uh, inclusions. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, two months ago, we also celebrated this $12 million uh, investment in the mills uh, in West Kalimantan with PT uh, HDL, a, a joint venture between Sri Lanka and Indonesia. With this kind of investment, they could also now cover much more smallholders or independent smallholders in the surrounding area. Uh, and in return, uh, we asked uh, the company or the mill. Uh, to support the independent smallholders to improve uh, the productivity, but also linking to ISPO and LSPO. So there's a mutual benefit uh, uh, obtained by uh, both smallholders, farmers, and also the mills, as well as the investors uh, coming from the financial in uh, investment. So uh, in brief, <coughs> uh, Padudi, uh, Ibu, uh, Diana, and others, I think, uh, understanding global uh, market challenge uh, it would require us also to uh, you know, see what sort of uh, demand uh, coming from uh, different parties, uh, prioritizing it and as well as uh, translating it in, uh, onto the ground, but also responding back to, uh, you know, uh, certain requests that they may request something, but also we need to get some help uh, and help needs to be also as concrete as possible. I mean, investment coming in, uh, off-taking agreement coming in, 
support uh, support for smallholders also are being improved. So I think we need to push more and more. So it's not about only one direction coming from the global level, but also uh, you know another direction coming from the producing country to the global market to say that okay, if they want something sustainable, they have to be also part of this journey. Thank you so much, Padidi. Okay, thank you, Pak Fitin Ardiansa. Very nice overview of the issues and challenges of the global market demand. Uh, before we go on with the next presenter, let's watch a video playback. Okay. The committee will play the video playback. Traceability plays an important role in supporting the transformation of the palm oil industry. But many stakeholders are skeptical that full traceability to the plantation or TTP is possible or even worthwhile. Complexity of the palm supply chain, suppliers that may not want to participate and the heavy resources needed are cited as reasons TTP will fail. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kita menganggap kerjasama dengan GAR ini, GAR ini ya uh, ada rasa curiga lah, ya curiga dalam arti ya bahwasannya bisa-bisa GAR ini membuka pabrik di sekitar kita. Awalnya jadi bayar ya bisa-bisa jadi kompetitor kita. Poin pertama tadi repot ya, karena kita ini kan orang lapangan. Jadi kadang kita menimbang TBS ini itu Kondisi kadang cuaca pas hujan, gerimis, nah, tentu kalau kita bawa HP Android nih, kadang terus terang saya pribadi sayang ya. Jadi kalau langsung kita input di sini nanti, nanti entah takut HP-nya rusak. GAR is now sharing its experience in TTP with independent suppliers, helping them map their supply chains back to the origin. The aim is for third-party mills to report full TTP by end 2020. To help suppliers, including small and medium mills in compiling the necessary mapping information, GAR is working with traceability system providers like GeoTraceability. GAR also supports TTP implementation by providing on-site training and mentoring for farmers, collecting data like farmer profiles and mapping boundaries, and providing technical tools like GeoTraceability software. Aplikasi ini akan memudahkan informasi ya dari pengurus ke kelompok tani atau ke anggota masing-masing. Karena apa biasanya kami kalau selesai nimbang di TPH masing-masing itu selalu ada pertanyaan dari anggota punya saya dapat berapa. Jadi dengan aplikasi ini saya harapkan cukup kita inputkan data satu kali orang nanti anggota masing-masing bisa langsung akses di HP masing-masing. Traceability means that GAR is able to guarantee the provenance of its raw materials, something increasingly valued by customers. More importantly, it helps GAR deepen engagement and help its suppliers adopt responsible practices leading to industry transformation. Mata rantai kami memasok ini seperti apa? Ada nggak istilahnya yang merusak lingkungan seperti bilang dari hutan, hutan terlarang atau hutan lindung? Dari kawasan gambut ada nggak? Saya rasa ini salah nggak ada Pak. Bapak-bapak kita sudah sama-sama memastikan itu legalitas tandan buah sawit itu tanahnya, kebun sawitnya tidak di daerah hutan lindung. Through traceability, GAR is also able to identify farmers that can benefit from training in good agricultural practices. This helps increase productivity and incomes. Achieving traceability to the plantation is not easy. But by working together, not only can this be achieved, but we can also transform the industry for the better. Dar has done it. You can do it too. Okay, thank you. We have uh, watched the video about traceability. I would like to remind you all to uh, fill in the attendance list, okay? Join workshop on Western supply chain, 
uh, and also please put your camera on while the presentation because this will be recorded to be uh, to be put in our e-learning uh, material okay i do believe that now we have all uh, <clears throat> a glance knowing about traceability to know it better uh, please join me to welcome dr gotch martin director of sustainability of strategic project in pt smart dbk Dr. Gotch Martin has been with GAR since 2015, leading the company sustainable initiative on the ground. His team focuses on areas such as forest and pit conservation, rehabilitation and management, community engagement with a focus on participative action and alternative livelihoods, responsible sourcing with a focus on supplier engagement and supply chain transformation. He has 12 years of experience in forest and land use, and sustainability related topics and has spent 11 years in South Asia. As a leading subject matter expert in this field, Mr. God sits on various committees, high carbon stock approach, executive committee, high conservation value resource network, management committee, RSPO pit land working group, and the RSPO biodiversity and high conservation value working group. Mr. God's Martin has been with Gara, okay, then all right. Okay, that's all about uh, Mr. Gotch Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, please join me to welcome Mr. Gotch Martin. Mr. Martin, the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you, Parudi, for the kind words. Um, okay. I think I need to change my profile picture. I, I, you can see if you if you uh, will join the palmer industry, it makes you look old very fast. Uh, <laughs> just uh, okay. um, yeah. Yes. Again, thank you, Parudi, um, also Bo Diana for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, very exciting to see kind of uh, many young Indonesians and also um, uh, international uh, students on, on screen. Obviously, also thank you, Pafitrian. Yeah, we know each other since a long time for your kind words. <laughs> um, always, always good to work and collaborate with uh, IDH. Um, I guess I can share my screen. Uh, Let's move. <clears throat> yeah, um, so obviously, as you have seen already all from the title, uh, I will elaborate quite a bit on traceability, but I, I think I want to go a little bit broader. Um, why are we actually doing traceability? And uh, I think Pa Fitrian has already indicated it. I think uh, one of the big criticism to the palm oil industry in general is still that um, palm oil is not yet deforestation free and uh, so obviously no deforestation um, uh, traceability is one of the key actions a company can take or an organization can take to um, work towards uh, no deforestation free supply chains but it's not the only tool um, I think it needs to have a, a package of different activities and so I will um, elaborate a little bit what uh, GAR uh, is doing in that respect. But maybe I think for, you know, for the ones who are not Indonesians on this call, uh, let me quickly uh, spare a word or two. Who is actually GAR? So we are a, a large um, integrated um, agribusiness company. We produce our own seeds. We run plantations, CPO mills. We have refineries. We do shipping. We do sales. Um, so we have that in-house, but obviously we are also kind of uh, relying on uh, third-party suppliers, uh, especially uh, smallholders. Just a couple of words, company is already quite old, uh, which also actually is an interesting thing, um, you know, established in 1962, which means that we are now in some of our plantations already in our third rotation. Um, uh, so palm oil is being replanted in large scale in Indonesia and does not always uh, then uh, result in deforestations. Um, we are managing around 500,000 hectares. Um, we have a, a large conservation area set aside. We provide uh, jobs and income for many people. Uh, traceability to plantation. Uh, achieved in 2020, uh, nearly 100%. Obviously, RSPO member uh, since a long time and uh, our guiding framework is the so-called GAR social and environmental uh, policy. Um, some highlights, you know, please visit our, our, our webpage if you wanna have more uh, details. But, uh, you know, I think in 
many people, especially outside Indonesia, actually don't know that the palm oil industry already since a long time, yeah, to more or less uh, successful, um, uh, have, have, have taken measures to reduce, um, you know, environmental destruction, you know, starting from fires, uh, no deforestation commitments, um, uh, expansion into supply chain, uh, etc. You know, if you have time, you know, feel free to visit our webpage and, and have a look by yourself. I uh, don't want to go into the details now. I think uh, Fitrian already showed it. The palm oil supply chain is extremely complex. Um, you know, if you if you see it here, um, here an example how it essentially looks for us. Yeah, I think uh, Golden Acre has its own estates, and Gar has managed plasma smallholders. Um, so this is something we understand very well and what we know very well. Um, then it's getting a bit more complicated. So then it's goes into the third party supply. Um, and there are, there the supply comes from independent smallholders, agents who are acting on behalf of uh, the smallholders. Then we are sourcing from estates, kind of larger companies, but we also source from mills, which have no um, own estates, but by themselves source from many, many um, suppliers. And to, you know, just to throw out a couple of numbers um, for you. So roughly, you know, we are talking essentially around 400 uh, mills, more or less plus minus. Uh, it's quite a dynamic uh, situation um, at the moment. Um, it's quite a competitive environment. And so um, there is quite a bit of movement in the supply chains for the big um, um, uh, refineries of the big, the big traders and processors. Uh, we have uh, mapped more than 50,000 smallholders, uh, independent smallholders, which are directly supplying to us. And I think now together with uh, Coltiva, as you have seen in the video, around 120,000 um, smallholders, uh, which are in our supply chain. Um, obviously, I think also agents are, uh, are still uh, there and play a very important role. Um, uh, I think um, small agents get a lot of, um, I think, negative feedback. Um, and uh, surely there are some um, kind of questionable um, activities in, in what agents are doing in parts, but they are also very important on the other side um, to actually connect many of the smallholders to the market, which they wouldn't be able to do so without the agents. Uh, also, I think uh, agents are still a very important um, yeah, way to get funding uh, to independent smallholders. Um, and so I think it's quite important if you talk about a supply chain transformation or you are working with landscapes that the agents need to be on board uh, in such a discussion. Um, yeah, directly impacted sourcing area for GAR is roughly around, you know, up to 1.5 million hectares, um, which is obviously a quite significant uh, amount of, of, of land. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have mentioned, um, you know, this is essentially still all about implementation. And I know for, you know, for many people, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite frustrating that there is still deforestation in palm oil supply chains. But, you know, I want to give a bit of shout out to the Indonesian government, uh, as well as some of the bigger uh, palm players. Um, I think it, it, it is quite remarkable in contrast to, um, you know, other commodities like soy, especially soy, um, that in Indonesia, the deforestation rate has now been decreasing uh, continuously since five years, uh, since its peak in 2015. Um, Although you know market prices have skyrocketed, although uh, COVID and there were concerns that monitoring in the on-site cannot be as tight, um, but still the deforestation rate has been um, uh, reduced is now at a record low, and so I think this is, in my view, uh, in our view, um, kind of an indication that um, the industry, the palm oil industry, is really serious about implementing. Uh, no deforestation in its supply chain. 
Um, yeah, no deforestation in, in our own concessions. Um, obviously, you will think that's a no-brainer uh, to achieve that, but it's not so simple. Um, why is that? I think, first of all, it's again around the size. Um, you can see we have roughly, I think now the latest data is around uh, nearly 80,000 hectares of, of conservation area that is spread across you know, uh, roughly 40 different locations. Obviously, the majority of them uh, have, have uh, larger shares. Uh, they are mainly based in, in Kalimantan. And uh, as you can see, the, the deforestation or the, the, the conservation area has been actually relatively fluid. Yeah, why is that? Obviously, there are kind of changes in concession boundaries. Um, there are kind of, you know, my teams or, or we have done reassessments of the conservation areas because some of the very initial assessments uh, have not been very precise um, uh, to say, but then there is also still, um, you know, encroachment and we still unfortunately also have still peat um, and, and forest fires. And so now the, the question is how can we tackle, um, especially the latter uh, two points, forest and peat fires. I think for that, what is really important, <clears throat> you can probably already, uh, no, what I'm talking about is that you need to bring the smallholders on board. You need to bring the communities on board, which live within or in close um, proximity to uh, our concessions, to your concessions. And so uh, GAR has now developed together with uh, a range of different partners and uh, stakeholders, a, a concept of what we call participatory conservation planning. Um, it starts, if you look on the left side, we have a lot of different mapping um, uh, activities. Um, really important, again, that from day one, the communities are on board and participate actively in these mapping processes. Um, we then essentially moderate um, a process within the village and um, uh, decide and detail out um, a conservation plan but also on the other side, a land use plan, uh, because um, we know that it is absolutely critical for communities to um, have enough land available for uh, food security, for economic uh, development, for economic use. And so in this process, uh, the output is a conservation plan as well, as well as a land use plan. And then these two different plans are uh, combined into a village spatial plan um, and is then uh, kind of approved by um, the local uh, regional um, uh, head uh, in, in Bahasa is the Bupati who more or less legalizes uh, this, this document so that there is kind of a, a formal uh, commitment to, to that uh, specific land use plan. Um, I think what is what is quite important is that um, obviously the communities obviously always ask what is in for us and you know this slide apologies is actually already now a year one and a half years old. I think now I would put for sure um, another bullet on it, which is called essentially carbon yeah. Um, uh, everybody talks about about carbon and so also communities know about carbon and so that might be an option, but I think what is important um, for sure is that. Um, then an outcome of this uh, village land use uh, spatial plan is essentially that there is a clear approach to conservation management and monitoring, that there are alternative livelihood options for the communities, um, that there is a clear area available for palm oil planting, either for ourselves or for the smallholders. Yeah, and then also I think if the document is legally binded, that gives also some uh, land tenure uh, to the communities as an additional benefit. Um, for GAR, we have done that now in uh, 22 villages, mainly in West Kalimantan. You know, the, the area of the villages has been quite large, um, quite a, a lot of forest has been set aside. Um, four, pro four projects have been approved. It's a relatively um, slow process, to be honest, um, because it requires government involvement at, at multiple levels. So it's, it, it takes a bit of time uh, to uh, engage, um, ideally in in physical meetings and obviously so in the past uh, two years it's now starting again the activities but in the past two years it was it was unfortunately because of um, uh, COVID uh, quite slow. 
Um, what is important <clears throat> to note at this stage, and I think that is one of the biggest challenges we are facing, and you know, I've seen Pafitrian has, has shared a couple of good examples on what is actually possible, but our, our specific villages have, in, in respect of cash payments, let's say, uh, have haven't received any money uh, for their commitment to deforestation, uh, no deforestation yet. So the only benefit what they have at the moment are, you know, livelihood alternatives provided by the company uh, that helps. But in, in the long term, uh, uh, you know, there needs to be more to, to make sure the communities really appreciate the value of the standing forests. Um, yeah, then the supply chain, um, our supply chain delivers roughly yeah, 65% of the oil we are processing. And so here then traceability becomes even, even more complex. Um, I think what is quite obviously again important on traceability is actually to really understand who is in your supply chain, who is there. Um, and uh, as I said, the supply chain is very uh, diverse. They are very um, professional uh, stock listed companies like ourselves, um, but then they are also not only smallholders, but they are also, I think in Indonesia, a lot uh, small and medium enterprises, um, uh, larger family, large family, uh, you know, kind of family based units, but they could be, you know, distributed a little bit across multiple kind of, in Indonesia, we call it Keluarga Besaria, the, the, all the relatives together could be, you know, a uh, hundred hectare or a bit more even. And so a lot of supply comes there. And so um, what, it, what, is, what is very important is that we have, um, we, we do our due diligence, yeah. Um, so once we know who the supplier is, there is kind of a, a risk identification. So we look into um, historical deforestation, existing uh, HCV, HCS assessments, uh, are they located in peatland or not? Do they have anything around GH uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Um, we look, um, uh, is there existing social or community engagement or uh, work environment in industrial relations, which looks at you know, fair labor uh, conditions, uh, working, working hours, wages, etc. And uh, what is what is um, uh, very very critical is that you don't leave the supplier alone. Uh, once you have identified him, made your due diligence, and you believe that the supplier is qualified to be in your supply chain, I think then you need to be very close to the supplier, you know, do handholding, uh, support the capacity uh, uh, building in the company, um, uh, follow up on the action plan, do site visits, um, and, and have also a very um, transparent uh, grievance handling system in place um, uh, to follow up in case uh, something is not going as planned. Um, yeah, here then on the traceability itself, and I wanna actually uh, combine traceability with no deforestation verification. So this is just an example. Um, as you've seen in the video, we work with a, a company called uh, Cultiva. Um, and uh, what Cultiva is really good at is that they have many people on the ground on site. And so uh, we are literally kind of walking around the smallholder plots um, and uh, and uh, uh, measure where the plot is, um, uh, who is the owner, what is the condition of the plot, and we can get some estimates on how much um, fresh fruit bunch can come from the smallholder. If we, once we have that data, we then overlay um, historic deforestation uh, data on these um, on these concessions or on the smallholder plots. And then we expect the respective um, uh, supply chain uh, member to verify these um, uh, deforestation alerts if they are because of palm oil development, if they are because of smallholder activities or local community activities or any other uh, natural disasters potentially. Uh, and then if uh, there has been palm oil development uh, after certain cutoff dates, uh, we prepare action plans um, together with the supplier uh, to remediate or to um, uh, 
yeah, to remediate the damage uh, which has been done in the past. And if the supplier has done so, <clears throat> uh, then then uh, the supplier can be marked as, as deforestation free, which is a uh, essentially beside uh, the ones mentioned before um, RSPO is a new kind of uh, uh, um, product premium which is kind of evolving at the moment that some of the uh, famous brands are starting to pay a premium for um, uh, no deforestation verified uh, products. Um, I think you know what what we are quite proud about is through our supplier engagement um, we have um, uh, engaged with many suppliers, uh, 29 concession holders, and uh, uh, proposed to them to uh, undertake HCB and HCS assessments. Um, uh, uh, an outcome of that uh, engagement was that uh, more than 100,000 hectares of forests have been now set aside uh, for conservation, which represented in that case nearly 30% of the, of the concessions. And, I think that is something we are quite uh, um, excited about. <clears throat> what happens if you are uh, not a good citizen um, is also quite clear. If we find a company um, who does not want to um, yeah, uh, engage with us at all, um, you know, permanently ignores or misses uh, deadlines, uh, then we also you know, at, at some stage take the consequent and uh, exclude uh, suppliers from our supply chain. Um, it's, it, it's nothing we, we like to do um, because once excluded from the supply chain, you are lacking a bit kind of the, the power to, um, to transform uh, that supplier, but um, uh, often, often there is no other choice. <clears throat> I think um, what I want to close with is obviously, you know, the, the root cause in many cases, you know, why, why do people still... Um, you know, uh, deforest and especially in, in some cases, um, uh, smallholders. And, and, you know, I don't wanna really blame um, smallholders for that, but in, in some cases, I believe, you know, smallholders are essentially, unfortunately, uh, desperate um, to, for, for money. And, and so that's why it's happening. What we have identified is um, uh, as the root cause is essentially uh, uh, around uh, food security. Um, um, and um, so we um, have uh, a lot of engagements um, to ensure that food security is there. Um, the second stage then is to kind of, um, you know, train and skill up um, communities um, uh, for alternative livelihood. And uh, especially nowadays, the development of small businesses. And I think it's really quite exciting to see in Indonesia on how many uh, tech-enabled startups are now uh, having um, uh, rural communities and smallholders in, their, in the back of their mind when they are um, kind of um, embarking on their journey. So I think it's quite exciting to see that kind of universe really uh, evolving at the moment. And then um, I, I think what is really important is that um, yeah, not everybody is an individual entrepreneur. And so, you know, most of the small businesses are really successful in, in our experience if they are based on, uh, on some farming groups. And that is uh, what we are engaging at the moment. Um, we normally start then with a livelihood assessment, uh, very important to understand community aspirations, uh, look what are, you know, their traditions and their histories. We create, a, a, a establish a demo plot uh, in the village. Um, very important is that there is a, a expert farmer uh, who lives on site and demonstrates really all the different uh, techniques uh, because we are uh, focusing on organic farming techniques normally and so to reduce um, the, the input cost. <clears throat> and uh, so it's quite important to have somebody qualified and who can also keep the, uh, the participants motivated. And then we try to you know, scale up um, Bit similar what Papi Trian described before is we try also to link it with some of our the brands in our supply chain who then are acting as a as a as a um, uh, off taker of the of the products. Yeah, we do projects mainly in uh, Kalimantan at the moment, uh, and as you can see, it's it's quite a wide variety. You know, as simple as 
essentially rice, uh, but we have also kind of other stuff like coffee and uh, pepper and uh, ginger and for sure different kinds of proteins available. Um, I think nowadays uh, in the past uh, year, um, uh, quite a lot towards uh, longer durable uh, products, which also could reach a larger or, or further away markets. Yeah, also a couple of numbers, you know, how we engage, um, uh, you know, with 22 villages, we are working on uh, fire-free villages, uh, 36 villages, the focus is on food security and, and livelihoods. Uh, we have, uh, we support a lot of schools, um, uh, training, te training the teachers um, and engage on the schools. Uh, we have um, obviously also some uh, stipendium for, for students. Yeah, and uh, um, you know we we impact quite a number of of uh, families um, uh, at the moment, uh, but obviously we would like to expand this even further because we believe that in the long term, what is really critical for uh, local communities is that um, they are resilient, and so resilience means that they have multiple sources of income, um, uh, and that part could be agribusiness. Um, there could truly be um, environmental service payments. Uh, there could be something else. A lot of training is, is needed to achieve that uh, resilience. And once you have a resilient uh, community, I think then also it will be, I don't wanna say simple, but it will be more easy, I believe, to uh, achieve a deforestation uh, free supply chain. I think that's it from here. Yeah, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to present uh, what we are doing, sharing some thoughts with you about um, uh, traceability and how to achieve uh, no deforestation free uh, supply chains. And uh, I wish all of you, you know, um, yeah, have a good uh, time in participating in this uh, webinar and uh, workshop. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Bosch Martin. Uh, participant, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, uh, watched the video on traceability and on the, the challenges of the global market demand, and also the presentation from the two speakers and from Prof. Alain Rival about the talent. Now we move on to the discussion session. We have around one, hand, one hour and uh, 25 minutes to discuss here. Yeah? Okay, uh, you can raise your hand on the Zoom or you can write your questions on the chat box or you can also say something to ask the question. Please make sure that uh, you, can, uh, you can address the question to which uh, speakers and then you can drop your questions orally or you can raise your hand. Okay. Again, we try to remind you to keep your camera on during the sessions because the program will be recorded. Okay. I invite the participant to raise hands or you can type your questions in the chat box. Okay. While we are waiting, okay, uh, I'd like to maybe just to give another explanation to the audience, Pak Fitrian. What is your biggest challenge uh, in, in working with your global marketing? What's your, your biggest challenge? Thank you, Pak Dudi. Um, I think one of the immediate challenges that uh, we have faced and also we are still facing is the fact that global market is not homogenous. Mm -hmm. um, we know that oil palm is imported to Europe and Europe, European market require, requires a stronger <clears throat> standard, yeah. for instance. Uh, with some, uh, like uh, goods also said, providing incentive, but some may not, or not yet. Uh, and also you've got <coughs> other global market players uh, uh, from big countries like China, India, um, uh, the Middle East, uh, and, uh, and others, including also um, uh, Southeast, East, uh, Southeast Asia region. 
and they uh, may also require some certain standard. And in fact, uh, I think, for instance, in India, they have already uh, mentioned about EPOS, Indian Palm Oil Standard, or in Indian Palm Oil Sustainability Standard, for instance, linking to ISPO. Uh, China, uh, some uh, companies are also requesting um, certain uh, sustainability standards. Uh, but compared to European uh, market players, um, they may not necessarily, I mean, Indian and, and Chinese um, market players may not necessarily provide the additional incentives, in fact, uh, to uh, us or to push further for sustainability transformations. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those are the, the things that uh, many uh, uh, companies like uh, Pak Guts Martin uh, is now with. And of course, smallholders, they are being us, but not yeah. necessarily being uh, supported with certain incentive and also certain assistance. But mm -hmm. maybe Pak Guts can add more. Okay. Before we go on that, okay, Pak Coach Martin, I have a question here from Tri Arini Utami from Malekosa University. The question is, why the concession boundary can change and how do concessions work? Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe maybe one word just in addition to what really Pa Fitrian just said. I think the challenge is really that the palm oil market is not everywhere the palm the same palm oil market um, this is this is the big challenge um, unfortunately i think now it needs to be quite clearly said that uh, the european union is becoming a less and less important buyer of indonesian palm oil um, and the importance is shifting to india pakistan bangladesh africa um, and some other asian countries and unfortunately europe is at the moment the only market destination which is engaging on the topic of sustainability while I think the other markets are still a couple of years ahead and so it is uh, um, uh, a challenge to make the case for sustainability really in, in palm oil. Maybe that's just in addition. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, for your, um, for, uh, no, Fitria, Fitria for the question. Um, yeah, so why do Tri uh, Ariani? Yeah, but so why do concessions change? Uh, also for me as a bullet, yeah, not so easy to understand why <laughs> concessions change. <laughs> but yeah. essentially, essentially, it's like this. Yeah, um, <clears throat> a, a company to be allowed to legally operate in Indonesia needs to go through a, a different cascade of licenses. Yeah, you start with Isin Lukasi, you get a land conversion li uh, license. Uh, wood utilization license and so on. And this process is taking uh, quite a bit of time. Um, and uh, at, at, at some stage you are reaching uh, a HGU, yeah, to so your, your final business license. And normally, and I think also Pa Fitrian can elaborate uh, quite a bit on this. Um, uh, and, and every step, normally the shape of the license is changing. And so, um, so, you know, until you have reached that status um, and in central Kalimantan, there are many um, palm plantations operating actually without a HGU because the uh, province is still uh, lacking the spatial plan. Um, and, and so there are continuous changes in the layout uh, of the concessions. Um, then once the HGU exists, um, there are uh, cases that some areas are, for example, not plantable, or that communities um, uh, request uh, changes in the HGU boundary to return some of the land to the communities. And these could then cause an adjustment of the uh, HGU as well. Okay. I hope that answers the question. All right, okay. Next question from Yahya Khan from Pakistan. Okay, uh, will you please give your remarks on applicability of blockchain technology in palm oil supply chain? Will it ensure sustainability both at small level as well? I think this is a good, yeah, that's, uh, a, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, we have done uh, trials with uh, blockchain on um, uh, on traceability. I, I think I think what is actually important is. You know, traceability, in my view, essentially describes the identification of your origin. 
where blockchain is playing a very or can play a very big role is then on tracing, essentially on live tracing along the different steps in the supply chain. Um, I think what the beauty is of blockchain is for sure that it can overcome concerns that confidential data is getting into you know, the wrong hands. Um, um, and so we had a relatively successful um, um, a program together with uh, Unilever um, uh, a couple of months back uh, and SAP where we tested it. And um, I think we are currently in discussions on how we can uh, roll out the program to, uh, uh, to a larger parts of the supply chain. Thank you, Pagos. Before you answer the next question, Pagos, I give you a break for a while. <laughs> Let's go to uh, Pak Fitri. Okay, this is a question from Rahma Safitri from Utas Negeri Medan. Okay. What I have heard from the present page, okay, conveyed by Mr. Fitrian about the many trending things that are happening now regarding palm oil palm plantation in the phenomena of forest and then fires, okay. Uh, is it stated that it is not good? What is, the, uh, what is the main basis for stating that the above statement is not good, okay? Because uh, 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 the news about including about stakeholders capitalism, get a report card okay will there be a lot of people who can impact okay this statement Pak Fitrian, you can give response to this okay um uh, Pak Rudy, thank you so much um first before i uh, respond to specific uh, questions uh, we need to understand uh, like i mentioned earlier there's just so much noise related to sustainability environment uh, coming from, let's say, the consuming countries, coming from the consumers, and of course, they're presented by media. So that's why you have to uh, segregate and also distinguish which one is the one, whether it is reliable, whether it is credible, and, and whatnot. Some NGOs, for instance, uh, brought up uh, good data and information. They do also uh, check the satellite imagery. They do also check the ground truthing, and in fact, working together with certain companies on the ground, and that's why they can come up with good and, and reliable data. But some others may only like focus on the noise itself. Uh, so I think that's also uh, going to be uh, difficult to uh, judge, especially now with social media and also with different type of medias. On the stakeholder capitalism, uh, I think now uh, I, I could say something along this line. Um, uh, so many companies uh, are of course uh, wanting to not only um, develop their portfolio and <coughs> as a result uh, getting the profitability but also they want uh, in many ways uh, to lead to or to create impacts uh, one of course on environmental positivity or nature positivity or climate positivity, positivity mean, which means that in terms of developing something, uh, producing something like uh, the case of uh, GAR, Golden Agri Resources or Sinalmas they want to produce palm oil, but in return, they also, uh, or eventually, they also want to show that this is not going to jeopardize uh, the nature and environment. So the investment that they are uh, investing or the, the money that they are investing would lead to also uh, that uh, type of things. Um, and uh, with social impacts, for instance, positive social impacts, they also want to create the narratives in which, yes, you can get the profit as a company, but the profit also going to be used to support smallholders uh, in the case of palm oil. That's what, what we call uh, 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 like shareholders capitalism with uh, meaningful impacts. Uh, in or uh, during the uh, COVID period, um, uh, people uh, check in the media, the New York Times, for instance, uh, and they found out, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they found out that uh, the first budget line or the first, let's say, uh, elements that many companies or some companies are uh, reducing or were de reducing are in fact the impacts that they uh, promised to achieve. Uh, so the profit also they, uh, they reduce a bit, but the, let's say the allocation for uh, budgeting to support smallholders, let's say to support social in in inclusion, to support environmental protection, those are the budget that uh, were uh, uh, yeah, slashed quite significantly, especially during COVID time. 
Uh, whether this is uh, understandable, this is something that we need to debate. <clears throat> I mean, at the end of the day, companies would like to make profit, but how much profit do they want to make so they can still continue their work, but also leading to impacts. I think this is something that's no right or wrong, but something that I think uh, as a university students like you, we need also to discuss. So stakeholder capitalism is, is about, okay, what sort of capitalism that can also have meaningful impacts uh, and during COVID time and also onward, I think there will be uh, more and more scrutiny, uh, Padudi, about you know what sort of uh, trajectory of growth of specific companies or groups of companies in which they can still maintain their profitability, but also still leading to meaningful impacts. Good. I hope it uh, it answered the questions. Now let's go back to Mr. Watch Martin. Uh, can you explain more about S A W E Water Guard? Yeah, interesting that uh, somebody heard about that process because I not mentioned it in the presentation. Yes, <laughs> Safe Water Garden is a is a is one project. Um, um, what we do for on sanitation, um, just again to you know make communities more resilient uh, to also towards future uh, climate change. Uh, it's a program we have established in in Banka Belitung and and just very recently started a new one. West Kalimantan. So the idea is to essentially provide um, uh, provide to the communities a reliable source of uh, good quality water, uh, while the wastewater at the same time is used to um, you know provide water and nutrition to uh, a garden uh, outside the house um, where uh, the farmers can grow. Um, you know, different above the ground uh, crops for either the market or selling. And so it's, it's the combination of livelihood and uh, sanitation, which we are quite excited about this project. Okay, good. This question is from Sahrul, uh, Maliku Saleh University. We have another question from Azar Kashi from Institute of Maliku Saleh. Okay. One of the reasons is environmental and social community engagement. So. How does GAR minimize the risk that occurred at this time? This is from Muhammad Azhar Kashi, Minister of Medical Science. He's asking about managing supply chain risk. Yeah, I, I think, I think um, that the key is really to understand with whom you are working with. Um, I think that is, that is one. Um, so I think the initial due diligence uh, is important. I think then uh, very important to do if you work with communities, it needs to be done in a participatory way, right? If you are kind of, if I come up with a, with a project idea here in, in, in Jakarta and tell, you know, if we do that now in this uh, uh, wherever Nangatayab in West Kalimantan, it will for sure fail. Yeah, the, the project idea needs to come from the communities and needs to be essentially driven by the communities, demanded by the community. And I think then in that dialogue, um, in my view, that is kind of the right pathway to a successful implementation and also to um, ensure the risk. Yeah, I think in many cases, it would be interesting to hear Pafitrian's uh, view mm -hmm. on this as well, because I think now in many cases, we are still at an early stage of the engagement. Yeah, two, three years in, um, everybody is still relatively <laughs> excited. Yeah. Yes. Mangat, yeah, and so let's see how that goes. Uh, you know, if you we are down the road five to ten years, I think it will be it will be challenging, right, to to see um, if there are a lot of external influences how you can maintain this. But I think key is really to yeah stay close to the communities and and make your process as participative as possible. Mm -hmm. Another question, Mr. Woods Martin. What is the correlation between reducing the cost of living and reducing the devastation? Oh, that's a that's a that's a very good um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, obviously, I think it depends. To be honest, in a large extent, mm -hmm. how the community was connected to the wider commercial world uh, when the deforestation happened. Yeah, I think if you if you think about a very you know, isolated forest-based community somewhere in Papua or in West or in Kalimantan in the center, I'm sure the cost of living will increase quite dramatically, right? So because mm -hmm. before that, everything was collected in the forest, uh, they were hunting in the forest or fishing and collecting fruit. So it was a lot of, um, yeah, a, a non-money-based uh, economy, um, 
while that as soon as there is an access road, um, it changes, right? We see immediately uh, nowadays, you, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated nowadays, if you see Indo Marets or, or Alpha Marets in the smallest village in, in uh, Kalimantan, uh, in, in Sumatra anyways, you, you see these supermarkets um, and people go there. And for sure, I think therefore the cost of living is increasing on the other side i think you know you see also that cash availability in these villages is also increasing um and uh, so yes you know they need to spend more cash but there is also more cash income from multiple sources you know so it's um it, I, I think it's not it, it's not a it's not so easy to have a clear uh, cut answer it really depends the starting point of the community um when uh, the plantation establishment happened. <clears throat> okay. And what kind of alternative you gave them when you reduce their dependency on the forest? You know, the alternative is uh, obviously can be many things, but uh, so I think the first is always organic farming is a very big one, uh, production of, of, of crops, uh, vegetables, um, uh, proteins. And then the second is um, yeah, durable crops. Um, I think Papitria again can, can give good examples on coffee uh, and, and, and other cocoa products, um, which could be traded in, into longer term. Yeah, what is, what is our challenge there is, is to meet um, customer expectations yeah, um, in respect of uh, quantity and quality. That is, that is a challenge. Uh, also, a challenge is if you go for organic certification, for example, it takes a long time, I think three years, if I'm not mistaken, until you can get certified. So how do you bridge the gap? Yeah, um, uh, that, is, that, is, that is quite uh, challenging. And now I think the last one, what we try to look at is really um, um, is, is environmental services. So not so much uh, focusing on carbon. It's more like kind of a forest area should exist, um, uh, water supplies, uh, uh, no, no fire. Uh, and there we have uh, one project in West Kalimantan uh, where we work with a forest conservation fund, uh, um, <coughs> one of uh, the forests who is uh, inside our concessions. Yeah. Good. Pak Fitri Nardian, do you have any uh, issues regarding this? What about this deforestation and then you know, reducing the independence to the forest with uh, your concept of dagang hijau. Eh? Okay, what do you think, Pak Fitri? Yeah, yeah Pak Ludi, um, we think uh, there's a need to uh, first uh, map and identify um, possible value chains uh, and commodities that can be developed in uh, the areas, uh, of course, uh, cultivated by farmers uh, that um, are like forest friendly. And I put uh, forest friendly as courses as possible because even coffee can be non-forest friendly. Uh, we have seen in, yeah. in Bukit Barisan Selatan, for instance, the encroachment uh, into national park. Uh, but if it is done properly, I mean, coffee can be one of the good uh, commodities uh, to have this kind of agroforestry mix of uh, you know forests as the shed grown tree uh, and uh, coffee itself uh, as uh, you know bringing uh, I mean the commodity it would bring values as well as uh, income uh, to uh, local communities. So uh, working together mostly with uh, companies like uh, Sinal Mas and different companies, we have um, uh, experience still until now in West Kalimantan with Bumitama, another company, uh, palm oil company, identifying in the high conservation value areas of them. Uh, uh, how many households living inside or in the surrounding area, what sort of activities that they are uh, already cultivating. Rice uh, goods is, is correct. Uh, mostly they also focusing on rice, but transforming uh, you know, conventional rice to uh, organic rice would take time. So in the meantime, also we provide some options. Um, and I think uh, some of the crops uh, can also be developed, but still low value. Um, and now we are also focusing on different um, uh, quite accelerated uh, commodities with uh, good value as well. Spices, I think, as a, can also be one of the options. Uh, pepper, um, uh, different type of things, uh, of course, coffee and cocoa. So it de depends, uh, also aquaculture. Uh, aquaculture so uh, like yeah. fish uh, uh, and, and different type of fish uh, can, that can be also 
giving quick cash uh, for communities without having to jeopardize uh, the forest. So I think the first uh, action that the company and also let's say local government needs to do is to identify and, and map the value chains and also the opportunities uh, that can be developed uh, with uh, the concern or the safeguard of uh, non deforestation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Pak Fitri and Pak uh, Martin, because European country is no longer the only Palmer destination, and then European uh, Union is still mostly concerned uh, to pay more for certified palm oil. Do you think this will increase the risk of increasing unsustainable management implementation? Pak Martin may give your opinion first. What do you think? <laughs> You know, yeah. complicated, complicated answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think, in principle, yes, there, there is a, there is a risk, yeah, because we still need to make the case that, you know, sustainability is is in, is essentially profitable. Yeah, that's that's what you need to make a case in 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 uh, for for a company, um, and so that making that case is not getting more easy uh, with these moves. On the other side, I think, you know, what is obviously has changed dramatically in the last five years is that there is now such a good understanding in the entire industry uh, to work towards, you know, a more sustainable um, uh, setup that I don't think that this can be reversed, right? I, I, think, I think there was a, a, a big chance in the last two years with COVID, with um, uh, kind of now very high market prices. And we haven't seen a spike in deforestation in the last two years, but still continued you know, re reduction of deforestation. And I think that is a clear indication that the industry as such, you know, in collaboration and support with the government private uh, 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 civil society organizations, donors organizations are kind of on the path to, to making the entire industry um, uh, more, more sustainable and, and see that this needs to be the, the common model, operating model. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic that um, even, even without the European Union buying, which I hope maybe, you know, um, they hopefully might change given they are now facing kind of soon an energy crisis in Europe um, that um, uh, we, we are on a good way here. Okay. But Vitrian, what do you think? Uh, just to add, uh, I think if we only focus on Europe and the values uh, created by, let's say, consumers or brands or buyers from Europe um, only, um, uh, like the, in the past, uh, certainly the indicator that uh, we are looking is only like the increase of uh, uh, certified palm oil yeah certified sustainable palm oil and uh, this like uh, goods mentioned uh, would not lead to uh, no deforestations or reduction of deforestation it will require much more efforts um, and europe is just one um, let's say market players so we need also to engage with different market players um, IDH, for instance, is now uh, being active in India, uh, soon enough also in China. Although, like uh, was also mentioned earlier, they are still far away. Um, um, uh, I mean, Europe is still like ahead of them. Uh, what I think also some uh, different companies, uh, big brands, they are also looking for a scalable uh, type of sourcing, uh, and also goods. Um, so it's not only about one particular supply chain, but the entire sourcing areas. Um, in which if they, if one uh, particular companies or farmers can uh, change their behavior and this can be replicated in uh, the surrounding areas, the entire uh, sourcing area will be having that kind of standard or at least improvement of practices, uh, both productivity, but also environmental protection and social inclusions. Uh, now there are some prototypes, uh, Paludi, or uh, pilots uh, done in different jurisdictions. I think uh, GAR also is being involved uh, in uh, some other jurisdictions uh, to support the local government, uh, working also together with uh, local growers to show that this can be done uh, with, uh, I wouldn't say minimum support, but this, with the support that we have now, uh, with the hope that eventually if it's, uh, you know, be, if it's uh, de being developed uh, to the level of uh, scalability at the sourcing area or at jurisdictions, uh, companies will then, uh, you know, would like to source from this. So it's not only about supply chains, but also the entire sourcing areas. 
I think this is still being cooked, she's still being developed, but Aceh, um, not Sumatra, uh, Jambi, or in, even in Malaysia, in Sabah, uh, that kind of things are being, uh, being developed. So hopefully this can uh, be part of the solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Fitrian and Pak Goods. All right, okay. Participants, do you still have any questions? I would like to remind you to fit in the attendance list. Don't forget, the link has been provided for you in the chat box. Okay, thank you, Pak Fitrian, Pak Goods Martin. The participants, you have a lot now to think about because the topic has been addressed by the speakers and we have watched the video. I believe that now you have meaningful resources to work, to work about and discuss in your group uh, to produce a solution of what is being discussed here. Thank if you. Maybe, Parudi, yes. only one word for me. If any yes, of the students who is uh. also um, in, in the Indonesian universities or even abroad, okay. is interested in doing internships or what uh, similar um, uh, working with us on, on you know, uh, bachelor thesis, master thesis, uh, okay. feel free to contact me. We are always uh, open and interested in Indonesian talent mm -hmm. to join the agribusiness sector. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Very good offer from uh, Pak Guts Martin. If any of you interested in writing or a thesis on this, about the entire business on everything, please contact Mr. Guts Martin. I think uh, I, I will have set the profile with you on the chat box, but maybe you can ask from the committee for a complete address of Pak Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of our present uh, workshop for the first day. I do believe that we have a lot now in our head because that's what the speaker wants, just to raise awareness in our mind. And I hope that we can produce a good solution for this after the workshop. Okay, I like to, to return the session back to Ibu Diana for the closing of the first day uh, seminar that we can continue tomorrow. Diana. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Rudy. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Gods and Pak Fitrian. Uh, really uh, fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, we all know your long experience and expertise is no doubt on this. But before that, uh, we would like to see, uh, 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 I hope you, uh, uh, to, uh, the two of you still have some time to see uh, what is the result of today's uh, presentation to see the, through the posters of the students. Uh, please do everybody take again your uh, uh, Mentimeter yes. and using the code. <laughs> Sorry, Ruth. Yes, <laughs> this is ahead. your part. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Menti.com. Yeah, yeah. The code 92086. Please, we all can watch a shift of uh, mindset. Do you know about sustainability management palm oil? Sustainably managed palm oil. Okay, not Very bad. good. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do understand. Okay. If you still remember before that, it's a dub, big dub. Yes, big dub. Only say a little, not very sure. <laughs> but now they all believe that they know about this sustainably managed palm oil. Quite, quite good now. Some accountability given, okay. Of course, they know. Great. Okay. Very good. We have 13 responses so far, 14 responses. I think they say a different wording to say yes here. Yeah? I know it better, I do understand, I know all about it, okay? They say different expression just to say that, yes, they do understand about sustainably managed palm oil now. Okay, the second question, what is the global market demand for palm oil supply chain industry? What is the global market demand for palm oil supply chain in the next? Global market demand. Grab your devices, go to menti.com, use the code 920086.
if you have problems to chat, you can just click on the chat box. The link will appear in your laptop. Okay. What is the global market demand for Parliament supply chain, agriculture, sustainable, farmers, environment, gender, environmental, okay, farmers income. That's the global market income, okay. Farmers income, environment, agrochemical, uh, sustainable, palm oil, those who are affecting the environment, okay. Yep. Okay, social impact. Environmental chemical, chemical present across most BDTS. Those affecting the environment. Okay, that's the global market demand for palm oil supply chain. They want, it can raise the farmer's income and also it concerns to the environmental impact. We have three, the third questions. Do we have any third questions? Okay, no, that one. is the last one. That's the last one, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Budiana. Your closing thank statement, please. Okay, thank you, Pat. <laughs> okay. Thank you, yeah. Pat Rudy. Thank you again, Pat Goss and Pat Fitrian. Um, it's really, uh, I mean, it's really great to have uh, like a very instant uh, impact of the understanding about the uh, proportional understanding about the sustainable palm oil. And all of the students is going to uh, are going to summarize uh, in the three minutes videos about. Uh, uh, explanation from both of the speakers. I hope <clears throat> you can work together in your group, just three minutes, uh, and it's really uh, valuable uh, to spread in the e-talent that is going to be shared through the CSSEO and CIRAD uh, e-talent website. So uh, hopefully it's not only stop here, but also going to be uh, spread after this um, workshop and please don't forget to also uh, uh, have uh, introductory of your members group uh, video also three minutes not you yourself introduce yourself but uh, you introduce members of your groups okay i think uh, it's uh, really not very bad for today it's uh, a great uh, meeting for the first day uh, great uh, great start start for the uh, four days of this workshop. Hopefully, we are going to have a complete understanding about sustainable palm oil and sustainable landscape at the end of this workshop. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Pak Gods. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pak Fitrian. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. Bye-bye. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.